Sorry for coming late today. I'll tell you a little story. True story. In the United States, large retail companies like Walmart, Macy's, and other retail stores have found a new way to encourage customers to come to their stores. And they hire some retired people who still want to be occupied, but are not worried about the money they get. They hire them as receptionists outside the door of the store. And they receive people, welcome to Walmart, welcome to Macy's, welcome to this store. And that has encouraged a lot of people to come to these stores and increase their business. In one of the stores, they hired a man who was very sweet and people loved him, but he always came 15 minutes late. The manager of the store got a little worried that he's such a good man, and why does he come 15 minutes late? So he asked him, he said, young man, not a young man, but he said, young man, you come late 15 minutes every day. What was happening if you came late in your old job, which you were, whatever you were doing, and how would they treat you if every day you came 15 minutes late? He put his head down, he said, they would say, good morning, Admiral, would you like your coffee? <laughs> so when I get late, I tell the Admiral story. Thank you very much. I want to talk to you today about one of the most important subjects on the spiritual path. And that is, it is a yoga. What does the word yoga mean? Yoga means union. Union with what? Union with your highest self. Union with God. Union with whatever you can achieve inside. There are so many forms of yoga people are practicing. Many of them are just different positions, different way you can twist and turn the body in different shapes. And those are called yogic exercises. People do them. I have studied them and also practiced them for a long time in my young age. I thought that maybe there is something that helps when you lie down in dead body form, you make faces uh, or your body in different animal forms. Maybe that is something that leads to union with God. It doesn't. It's just an exercise for the body. And good exercise helps all of us. But it's not like jogging, not like running, because yoga exercises and there are 84 of them listed in our books, and I tried those 85, 84. Those can be performed in a very small space. The whole idea of the yogic exercises was that when those yogis, the practitioners of yoga, wanted to practice for long periods their meditational exercises, they hid themselves in small caves, and those caves had very little space. So while they were in a cave trying to meditate, they would keep the body in good shape by these exercises. The exercise had nothing to do with meditation. So meditation was different. And they would then proceed to have a session of meditation, which was separate yoga. But we sometimes believe that only exercises are good enough. No, they are only for the body. Then what is for the mind and what is for the soul? There are other kinds of yoga where you draw attention to different centers in the body. Most of the yogic practices, starting from Patanjali and creating Ashtan Yoga and many other types of yoga, Kundalini, reversal of Kundalini, I happen to try many of them in my young age. They are all interested in having unusual experiences by concentrating your attention on the six energy centers that lie at the eyes and below, and at the rectum, genitals, in the navel, the heart, the throat, and the eyes. There are six centers of energy. 
and they want to practice so that they can experience different forms of energy. They devise different kinds of mantras, repetition of different words at each center, and they practiced it. And it does lead to unusual experiences. Some of them give you unusual extra feeling of energy, a boost of energy of different kinds. And energy, this, they used to practice, and even in Buddhist monasteries where I practiced for a while, I practiced both in the Mahayana and the Hinayana schools. Uh, the Mahayana school believes that it's the Sangam, it's the large gathering of people where we can work together, you get more benefit. Hinayana said, no, it's a tantric thing, and therefore it's a personal thing. And some introduced yoga, which was just merely a sexual affair between people. And they said sexual energy, which was part of the so-called awakening of Kundalini in the original yoga. They practiced all these. If the heart center, some people could have an energetic experience that they could be out of a body and see the body is separate. Now, all these are very interesting yogas. And those who are interested in developing energies of various sorts, they like those yogas and there is no harm doing them. But that is not something that was taught by great master and that was not what I am recommending to people. Because I am recommending in a human life we have an opportunity to have much higher awareness of ourselves, to discover who we are. None of these yogas lets you know who you are. They give you unusual experiences, but they do not let you know who you are or discover your truth and discover your union, the yoga, with the truth. Eventually, the yoga that great master Baba Savan Singh taught, which I practiced and found very useful, is also yoga, but it's called Surta Shabd Yoga. Surta Shabd Yoga means Surta is attention, Shabd is sound, and to put your attention on the sound and have union. Now this is in a little bit uh, misunderstood by people. That's Surta Shabd Yoga. What is the idea of putting your attention on a sound? Wouldn't you like to put attention on yourself? Wouldn't you like to put attention on where you belong? Wouldn't you like to put attention on God? What is this business of putting your attention on sound? But the theory behind this is very simple, and I want to explain that today, because the Surtha the Yoga worked for me, and that's why I'm sharing this information with you. Shabd means sound. It can be spoken sound. It can be Shabd that is just, he sang a, a song, it can be called a Shabd. I am talking to you, I am talking in Shabd. The word Shabd is just a meaning that something that can be heard by us. It is audible. And that is why we call it Shabd. But this is uh, not merely an expression of a sound or a word. When you look at the spiritual literature of all religions, you find mention of it there. In the Christian Bible, James, uh, John's opening verses in the Gospel says, in the beginning was the Word, that's Shabd. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and nothing was made that was not made by Him, all reference to the Word. The Bible has placed the Word ahead of God, as if the God was also made by something that is audible like a Word. In the Rig Veda, of the Hindu literature, in the four Vedas. Four Vedas deal with all aspects of human life. The Rig Veda deals with the spiritual side of it. In the Rig Veda, the entire creation is supposed to have come from a nod. Nod, a song or a sound that comes. In Islamic literature, they talk of Bange Asmani, that is a sound coming from the sky. Or Isme Azam, the highest name. When you see this, we realize they are also talking of a sound. 
every literature, every religion, the founders have emphasized the importance of something that is audible. You can call it sound, word. Some have called it the music of the spheres. So all this shows that this gets reference to something that is just a sound in various forms. And that is why, what is the great importance? Why talk of sound rather than power, energy, things like that? So I'll explain that, what that really means. And why, how it has be practiced. Sound is essential for us to go on a spiritual path. Supposing I had not given you my talk, at least I could not share what I've experienced. I've given my talk in words and sound. Starting point, you read books, words, you read, your mind repeats them, sound. Very first step in getting any information about the spiritual path is in words. But these are spoken words, written words. And in the great master's Punjabi talks, he would call them varanatmak shabd. Varanatmak means which can be spoken and written. Can be varnan, that means it can be communicated through spoken language. That means sound can be twisted around to make words and people can understand you. The varanatmak shabd is the beginning of a spiritual exercise. Without that, you don't move forward. Then the masters tell us that there is a sound going on within you if you put your attention on your own self. They say, put your attention on the third eye center, which I mentioned to you yesterday. And they say, you can hear a sound. What sound is that? People have questioned. Well, how, could, how can we hear a sound and a sound that pulls you if you put your attention on it? That is the sound of the self. It's not any other sound. It so happens that when we are in a human body, our consciousness, which has taken the form of a soul inside a human body, the soul is manifesting itself in the form of sound. Why does it manifest as sound? Because if it doesn't manifest any other way, we take it as an experience outside. There's a big difference in experiencing sound from outside, including varanatmak sound, and experiencing sound that's coming from your own self. Now, if the, there was no sound at all, situated as we are in human bodies, we would never know where we are, who we are. It's a very easy way to identify that we are somewhere as a soul, as a life force, sitting somewhere in our head, and that is emitting a sound. It's not a sound coming from anywhere else. Therefore, when we hear the sound inside, that sound or shabd can become an expression of the self. We do not hear sound just for the sake of hearing a sound. It just so happens that the one sound, not all sounds, one sound comes from our own self, our own consciousness, as it is sitting in a human body in a wakeful state. That is why it becomes easy when we use other methods to prevent a distraction of our attention by repeating words. Why do we repeat words which they call mantra or simran? It's not that there is any power in the mantra unless they have been made special or empowered by some magical way, by a master or by a yogi or somebody. Otherwise, why we repeat words is to prevent the mind from thinking. Some people speak with their tongue and keep on thinking of other things. That's no good. No matter how big the mantra is, no matter how powerful the words are, if they are only being repeated with the mouth, like a varanatma shabd, and the mind can think anything, they're useless. But if the mind has started to speak, and that's the correct way to use the words, if you repeat the word with the mind, then you are replacing 
the thoughts with those words. And that's the main function. Main function of repetition with the thoughts is that you are replacing your other thoughts. And as you concentrate your attention on those words, it helps in removing thoughts. But this is only helping you to localize yourself in the area within the head. But there is no pull in that. You can't pull yourself to yourself by merely repetition of any words, no matter how better, good they are. So therefore, the best way to pull yourself to yourself is to put your attention to something that is manifesting from your own self. This is one of the greatest gifts given to us, that this self of ours, true self, the ultimate self, is generating a manifestation in different forms and the most easy forms to follow is the sound that emanates from it. The sound can be recognized because it is somewhat similar to a sound that we hear in a big bell. And sometimes people wonder, was that the reason why the big bells were put up on the churches? Was that the reason that every religion tries to play with bells and music? Is that the way why chanting is started? Is that the way why music is a part of all religious ceremonies? Maybe it is, maybe it's just a symbolic way to express that the self in the physical human form at the wakeful state can be accessed by listening to it. Why are we not listening to it all the time then, if that is the self? Because our attention is not on our self. Our attention is on the experiences of the self. And all these experiences created by the mind, by thoughts, and by the sense perceptions, and with the functions of the human body, are taking us outside. There is nothing to pull us inside. We close our eyes, it is dark. Why should we go inside? There is nothing to attract us. Outside, a lot of attractions are there, which have been created as an external world of ours, external creation. So that is why we are not listening to it. The only way to listen to it is to shift the attention from outside to inside. It takes a little while, but if you are repeating words in order to localize yourself, your attention inside your head, at least you can know you are there. And some people think that this is a magical formula, just keep on repeating, something will happen. No. You must listen to the words you repeat. Not repeat words, listen to the words you repeat. Secret listening, not repeating. We missed that point? That is the listening capacity that's so important in us. And you will find sounds change with the levels of awareness. Ultimately, they are not like a sound at all. It is a sound only in the physical level. They change as we go along. And therefore, you cannot even call it a sound at a certain stage, yet it looks sound from here. That is why it's just a manifestation of the presence of our own self as a soul, as a unit of consciousness. And that is why the capacity to listen goes on. These sense perceptions, I mentioned, five of them are recognized in our body, in our astral body. All five senses are there. After that, only two senses remain. And which are those? Seeing and listening. These two continue. That is why the other experiences become visions and listening. So listening is a very big thing. When we repeat words and listen to them, the effect is also the same because that draws you to your mind, which is inside, and you're listening to words being repeated by the mind. It helps you to go, and then you can listen to your own self, the soul. These are covers upon ourselves. The soul is covered by mind, mind is covered by senses, senses are covered by this physical body. They are all lying within. And as we listen to something deeper, we go deeper and become unaware of the outer cover. It's a very simple method. When we hear the sound that I am speaking to you, or the repetition we do in ourselves, those are varanatmak shabd. That's not the sound that is representing in any higher awareness. It helps. When you begin to hear a sound that is not being uttered by you, it is not coming from outside, it is not a biological sound because of the blood circulating in your veins, 
it's not one of the sounds that you can feel is coming from right, left or anywhere. Where you feel the sound is coming from the center, a little above the center, where your consciousness at wakeful state resides, that's the sound that will start pulling you. It's an amazing experience. If you catch that sound, it helps you to withdraw your attention from the body faster than anything else. And this is an experience many people have. The secret is the sound. That sound when you hear is not a sound that we write or we speak. And therefore the varanatmak shabd turns into what we call dhunatmak shabd. Dhun means a sound that continues, but it's not something that we're using in words. So varanatmak shabd becomes dhunatmak shabd when it starts pulling us inside. Then we don't need anything else. People sometimes keep on repeating the mantra, maybe it'll increase the sound. It does not. Because the repetition of the words at that time is only bringing you back into a mental level which was used just to put your attention behind the eyes. When the sound that pulls you come, nothing else is needed to go further on your journey to your own self except listening to that sound. The Dhonnatmak Shabd will take you. And if you listen attentively for a sufficient period, you will see you become unaware of your physical body faster than any other means. So that's why it's such an important thing. This is the secret of the Surta Shabda Yoga, that you can attain what you want, self-awareness and self-knowledge, by listening to the sound that comes from the self. It's a manifestation of the self. It's different from other sounds. Now, why I say other sounds? Because when you close your ears, close your eyes, want to listen, you can hear many sounds. Many of them are physiological phenomena. And people can see that they are because when you are in high tension, many sounds can be heard, apart from the gurgling in the stomach and some other sound which people hear. I'm not talking of those at all. But these sounds that you can hear in the ear, some seem to come from the left ear, some come from the right ear. Those sounds are being generated by different functions in our physical system. And some people have thought that listening to the sound on the right side takes you up, left side brings you down. I, I should clarify that, that this is a mere statement made because of the location of the intuitive side and the rational side in the brain on two sides. And that is why it's recommended if you cannot hear any sound in the center, then preferably listen to the right. But a man comes to me and says, I have been listening to this sound in the right ear for 15 years, nothing has happened. I said, nothing will happen. You are listening to a sound which is not yourself. But these mistakes we are making because we haven't understood what the purpose of the sound is. So that is why I am explaining. These sounds that come, and they can sound like sounds, thunder, sounds of drums, sounds like crickets, sounds like birds chirping, these are all temporary sounds that come from various sides of the head. And they, none of them has a pull to help you to go to your own self. And still I recommend, if you cannot hear the sound of the self for a while, no harm listening to these sounds, because still you are local, localizing your attention to somewhere close to the head, somewhere close to the center. So I call them practice sounds. So you can practice with these sounds till the real sound can be heard, which will be in the center. It will be like it is surrounding you. That is a surround sound that you can feel it's all around you. Sometimes you can feel it's all around you, only inside. And when it starts pulling, you become less aware of the body. It looks like surrounding you all over, surrounding all even outside of yourself. Because when you are pulling your attention from the physical body, another outside open, which is not this outside. So when you hear it all around you, you think maybe it's around in this space. It's not. It's an inner space. So the inner space opens up like a new sky. And that is why the sound looks like a surround sound. And it has a very strong pull if you put your attention on it. And that is the sound that takes you to the next stage. Dhunat Bhakshabd. The listening to the sound which is not words, but can be heard very 
clearly coming from the center of your head within. Next step. If it takes you to a point where you forget your physical body, it can open up the entire experiences of the next level of awareness. The next level of awareness is very, very interesting place. I call it place, it's just an opening up a new experience. What is the experience after you pull it out? You go into a level of awareness or consciousness, which is called an overlap of the physical and the astral experiences. Overlap means you can feel you are here, you can also feel you are somewhere else at the same time. You have no physical body, no material body, but you have a body, body because you still have the sense perceptions almost placed in the other form where it's placed on this body. So you feel you can run about, you can do anything, but you can do many more things. You can change your face, you can change your form, you can do many other things in that form, but you can still have experience of things happening in this world. That is why some people, when people die, what happens to them? They leave their body. The astral self or the disembodied self is still carrying all the sense perceptions. They can see us. We can't see them because we can only see matter. We can only see physical things. But they can see us and sometimes we say, I feel there is a person here. They try to come and interfere with us. They come to contact us and they try to shake our hand and walk through us. So it's very, it's very frustrating for a disembodied spirit trying to contact a physical being. But we sometimes feel their presence, but we can't really see them and we can't be sure that they are there. Sometimes they stay in different places. We call them haunted places. That these, these, we know soul is here haunting this place. It's not the soul. It's just the disembodied astral form of the person who died. And they can sometimes stay in the same places because of their attachment or because of a traumatic, traumatic event that happened in physical life. For example, a person is murdered, killed, not a natural death by, by murder. That person stays at that place. The astral self was designed before the murder to live a certain number of years. And that astral life, notional life of that person has been cut short by murder. That body is dead before it was supposed to be naturally dead. That remaining portion of life, the person remains there. And he's stuck there. A person commits suicide, can be stuck there. It's an ending of the life which was normally supposed to be more. And what is more is already written. And this is part of destiny, that you have an actual physical experience life, or you have a life which is notional, that means you were supposed to be here, but you are not. And you are actually here, but not in physical form. And you spend that time in the astral form, in the overlap for the rest of your time. We call some of these beings as ghosts. In, in India, we distinguish between two types of ghosts. They are disembodied spirits, but we call them Ghost is not a very good word. Disembodied spirit, I coined that word, it looks better. But the meaning is the same. In India, we call in Punjabi language, Bhut and Preth. If you have heard the two words, Bhut and Preth. What's the difference? The Bhut is a ghost or disembodied spirit that has left the body, naturally or otherwise, and has not been able to fulfill its desire to go to places and is roaming around all over the world. Since it can roam around very fast in that body, it roams around and is available in different places and it's a flying ghost and a flying disembodied spirit and therefore we call it both. Preth is something that is stuck to that place because the event that killed the person or killed the human body was at that, at that particular location and the trauma that created it is holding that uh, disembodied spirit there. So these two types are there, but there are different desires people had and which they could not be fulfilled during physical life and they cut short. Therefore, they try to fulfill them in, the, in their disembodied form. 
So this is all that is happening. It's a natural phenomenon. It's not something unusual happening. It happens all the time. When I uh, tell some people in my talks, when I come, some of the disembodied spirits also come to listen to me, they get a little frightened. Where are they sitting? I, but this is something, some people can feel them, some people can see them also. And this is a very interesting experience. But if you are experiencing the astral plane, you can see those disembodied spirits, because you are in disembodied spirit also. The beauty of the experiences we have as human beings is that within the human frame, within this body, are all the bodies. When you become unaware of one level, the other level opens up, and the world that exists in that form opens up along with it. When you have physical, material, physical, material body and physical, material world becomes real. When you are not physical, the other world becomes real. When you are in the overlap, both become real in a disembodied state. It's a very interesting experience. I'm mentioning this because people have these experiences during meditation. So, nothing unusual. I also want to mention that this dhun at bhakshabd, the sound, can be heard not only by ears when you are in a physical self, it can be heard when you are completely unaware of the physical body. It can still be heard, but it changes its form slightly. The form changes is, when we start hearing now, it looks like it came when we started hearing, and when we stop, it stops hearing. We don't hear it anymore. When you hear the next level, you find it doesn't look like you have just started hearing. Suddenly appears you have been hearing it all the time. That this was there all the time. Somehow, how did you miss it? It does not look that it started and ended. It looks like it is, was always there. And you were aware that it was always there. It comes back. You have always been hearing it. And, and you don't even feel that you missed it, that it's always there. Therefore, we change the name of the, the sound of the Shabd from Dhun Atmak to Anhad Shabd. Anhad means which has no beginning, no middle, no end, because that's the experience we have. The experience of that sound, which is still coming from the self. It's still covered with the mind and it's coming through that. And therefore, we call it the Anhad Shabd, which means it has no boundaries, it's endless. It's, it's not merely we call it endless because it is representing the immortality of the soul. We call it so because we experience it like that. We experience the sound was always there and we just happened to go into it. Powerful experience. It takes you into the causal plane and you can see that your senses were also just a body and you left it. Now, there is an overlap now, again, between the astral self and the causal self. That means, at that stage, when the Anhad Shabd is heard, and you experience what is around you, new sky, new world opens up, sky's color changes. This sky that we see in the physical plane is governed by a principle of light and darkness. We have a day, we have a night. In this sky, we always have days and nights because of the nature of the creation here. In the astral plane, there is no night and no real day also. But there is a subdued uh, grayish light always available. You, When you close your eyes and sit for in contemplation for a while, you can see things, you can remember things. What kind of sky do you see? It's a sky that is always like a twilight sky and that's always there. When you are pulled to the Anhad Shabd stage, the color of the sky becomes bright, and it's like a bright golden sky. The golden sky means, if you see a sun setting, you see beautiful, you can see the sun. No, you can't see it when it's up there white, but it's setting the golden color of the sun, the yellowish golden sky. Supposing you stretch that setting sun all over the sky, that's the astral sky. It's a beautiful experience. By the way, some people mentioned to me in meditation, they have a short glimpse of the sky or golden. Sometimes they see golden, uh, golden things which have been created by the 
light of this golden sky, glimpses of different levels can come anytime. If you're a regular meditator, you can have glimpses of any level of consciousness because they're all there with you. But you cannot sustain them because your attention drops immediately to what is considered right, uh, uh, real outside. So glimpses you can have of any of these levels that I would explain to you. But if you sustain, your meditation is regular, and you sustain yourself there, then the golden sky is the astral sky and forms an overlap. So you see the astral and the causals, they overlap. Now, this is an interesting point I want to bring to your notice, that what is the shape of this created universe? Here we are sitting here, we have time and space. How big is the space? Infinite. Okay. Infinite in which direction? Every direction. Now, if infinity is a number, and you make something which is infinite, you will see if it's infinite on all sides, it becomes a huge globe. Infinite size, but still, a, still spherical. It becomes a sphere. This is not a notional thing. This is the way this universe is structured. And I'll also explain what the meaning of infinity is. Infinity is as far as you can go and more. It is not really infinity because you can't go more. So where does infinity stop where you can't go? Are you tired? You don't have time? Or it's like pi, you keep on writing the number pi, this is infinite because you can't complete it. So similarly, it becomes a big sphere of infinite dimensions. The astral plane is also spherical. It has time and space, but a different type of time and space where time can be held, frozen, or released. So it's a larger sphere. It's bigger infinity. That doesn't mean much here. Bigger infinity means there's a larger sphere of space and time, and there's an overlap between the two. Now, if you put two spheres, and part of it is overlapping, you will see it forms the shape of a fish. The overlap part becomes like a shape, actually like a fish, and with a little side also coming to the other two sides. Now, supposing you have two spheres, causal plane, also creating time is a much larger infinite sphere. Uh, these are words right now, but when you experience, you will understand what I mean, what is larger and smaller, infinite, both are, all of them infinite, but a larger infinite sphere. So here are three spheres to generate the experiences of time and space. It's a big sphere, a larger sphere over it, and a still larger sphere, creating two big fishes. If you have knowledge of these, the second one is very strange. The spheres are not placed directly above each other. They are placed at an angle. So the angle creates the feeling, if you're in the center of the second overlap, you can have an experience one side of the astral plane and the other side of the causal plane. This particular spot itself is a world of many kinds because it's a dual nature and it has been described in our literature as the bunk nal or the crooked tunnel. Some people say, what, can, what is crooked tunnel? Crooked tunnel is just the shape in the center of the second, and you experience it like that, that you can have experience of both on two sides. It's very interesting, the time-space thing there. So the crooked tunnel is the center of the second fish. Now, I heard that in the Bible, a story is told of Jesus Christ feeding 5,000 people or 50,000 people with two fish. And people take it literally, maybe he caught two fish from the pond and broke into pieces and gave them. Not at all. It was knowledge of the inner spheres that he was sharing with them and was represented in a parable of the two fish. And it's all about inner consciousness. And 50,000 people can be given the delivery. A million people can be given the knowledge of two fish. They still remain two fish. 
This is just the shape of the structure of these three worlds, the physical, the astral, and the causal. Now, when we go to the sound part, the causal, the unhad shabd, which is an experience of the endlessness of that sound, we can, through the mind, and there's nothing else left but the mind, there no senses, no body, it's a mental hearing. The mental hearing does not become a sound as we know it. When we listen, we know we're listening to ourselves. The self is the sound. That is why after Anhad Shabd, the word they have used to describe in a lot of literature is called Sar Shabd. Sar Shabd means real sound. Real sound is the self. And that's when the discovery comes that the self was not the mind, was not the senses, not the body, and we are a unit of consciousness and part of the reality, part of our totality. We also call that experience as Parabrahm, because Brahm experience is considered to be the end of the mind, and Parabrahm means it is beyond the mind, and therefore, for the first time, we are experiencing our reality as consciousness, a creative consciousness that has created the three universes below for various types of experiences. It's a personal knowledge. And yet, we have the experience of the many. We feel the many souls. But we have reached the totality of our immortality. There is no birth and death there. We discover we have always been there. Now, always there are two types of always there. I sometimes feel, uh, how do you describe these things? So difficult to describe something now going beyond time and space. I can say, look at time. Here time looks like it is flowing through us. It doesn't look like we are flowing through time. Looks like now one hour has passed, two hours have passed, I came here, I sat here, events took place. Time is passing from future, it's moving to present and going back into irretrievable past. That's our experience in the physical plane. And we can't do anything about it. I like something, I want to hold it, I can't do it, it passes. I, I find that a, a very nice event that I had and I wanted to see it, more of it. No, time passed, it went away. We go to a movie and see the movie, the movie doesn't stop just goes away. We want to sometimes hold on to something, but we can't. From the movie I remember, now people sometimes feel that we are creating this universe. If we had chance to go back, we could change it. That's not true. Even if you could go back in time and come again, you'd have the same events again. In India, I remember, there was a young boy in a village. He had never seen a movie. So his friends took him first time into the town to show him a movie. In that movie, there was a scene where a girl comes, a village girl comes, takes off her clothes and has a dip in the pool. And so, but before she can take off her clothes and become naked, a train comes and passes in front. So he can't see, train is gone, she's already in the pool. The little boy stayed in town to watch that movie 20 times, hoping one day the train will be late. <laughs> this is how we also think of life, that you can change it. No, nothing changes. The truth is that time is created at one go, and all events are placed upon it at one time. We are moving on time, looks like time is moving through us. Here we can't do anything about this. In the astral plane, we can hold the movie. That guy, if he was astral plane, could hold the train. But still, the train would pass at the same time. The, the point I'm making is time becomes different. In the causal plane, we can see the time is steady, we are moving, and we can willingly move backwards or forward on time. A problem which is besetting the scientists today, the scientists have accepted Einsteinian version of time-space as if time is merely an ordinate of space, 
and therefore it's one thing continuum time space is one thing if really it is one thing in space i can go there and come back why can't i go it in time i should be able to go an hour ahead and come back to the same hour if space time is the same thing why can't we do it scientists don't know we can and it's exactly what they're saying but it's not done here it's done somewhere else is done with our mind when we are not confined by the physical and astral bodies so therefore there we experience the reality of what einsteinian time space is and here we are trying to figure out something and some very odd odd kind of research is going on to see if the atoms have a particular curvature in them and somebody has found one atom with a curvature maybe they're designed to move time forward only it cannot go back rest of space we can move back and forth still a big problem if they had gone to the causal plane they'll see it's a natural phenomenon that this what's blocking is these covers of the sense perceptions and the body physical body but the sar shabd which tells you you are the true form it was merely a sound created for you to identify yourself and nothing more and you realize we still call it the shabd because from ordinary sound listening to sound we have come to a realization where it came from and so the parabrahm which is beyond the mind where the experience of sar shabd takes place it has two parts there's a lower part of that parabrahm which is really responsible for creating time space that creates the mind it creates the mind and from the mind all time space is created the upper part is completely timeless upper part of parabrahm is actually part of our true home now it's very difficult to use any analogies uh, i am using all the analogies upper lower they don't really apply there you forgive me for telling you lies about something because they can't tell the truth there's no way to describe the truth so we have to make stories i don't think i am only making stories all the mystics all the saints made stories because there was no way to describe it the yogis described even simple things by saying tell us what you see they said neti neti they can say this is not this was not it this was not it they can't say what it was so that is why i am just explaining in terms which we can understand here mentally appreciate it's some kind of a structure some kind of a creative structure in which life is being created consciousness is operating to create experiences but the so far as time is concerned we reach a timeless state which is if i have to use an analogy the upper part of parabrahm is part of our true home such kind if i give an analogy that we are on an ocean there are some islands there's a big island then there's a bigger island and so we are at a big top of an island which is part of the group of islands which is our true home and we have lots of millions of islands trillions of islands there each island represent one individuated soul okay that's a good example a big place but when we reach the top of parabrahm and we have an experience we can even experience our true home from there because part of true home and yet the difference is the many and the one we have still not found that what looks like many is still one we still think we are drops and not the ocean and we can see the ocean as it separate and not in sense i don't know how to say it how we can experience our individual soul and know it's part of the total but still individual soul and there are many souls why is this been designed like this and i explain to you because the difference between knowledge of your own self and the knowledge of totality is different the knowledge of your own self of an immortal self soul immortal self has been discovered in parabrahm and people who have reached there are considered to be sad gurus but to go over to the other side a void has been created there are many voids this is also a void that we are sitting here and we can't even go in to the astral plane it's a big void 
a big one, and so much effort we make to go and we can't go. But the biggest void that exists in creation is the void between Parabrahm and the totality of our own home, Satchkhand, true home. Satchkhand means true home. Parabrahm means beyond the mind. It's beyond the mind, we discover the soul, not yet found, our totality. What is the gap between the two? It's like having a dip. You see from the top of a mountain that you can see as a peak, you go down, you can't see it. Then you go to the top, you can again see it, you go down. It's something like that. Just a physical representation of the distinction between our discovery of our own soul, this unit of con uh, consciousness, and totality of consciousness, to cross that void is the most difficult part. Some, it has been described in the literature as Bhavar Gufa. I might have heard this word, Bhavar Gufa. That means it's a cave that's whirling around. Why is it called a cave? It's the darkest spot, if you can say darkness has been created. No darkness has been created here. This is absence of light. What we call dark here is absence of light. Actually, I understand when Einstein was a young student, he asked these questions from his teacher. And he says, what is darkness? He said, have you ever measured darkness? We only measure light. When it's not there, we call it darkness. Absence of a thing doesn't mean it's a thing, but there it's a thing. Bhavar Gufa is a created darkness that is now used. All these elements are being used in very small doses into other creations down below. The Bhavar Gufa means it's a whirling cave. That means if you, with your own light, with your own vision, with your own spectacle, with your own ability, which you can have still at the end in a different form, you cannot go through it. Even the mystics who have reached that level have not been able to go through it. They go in and come out the same way. The whirling is so fast. To cross that, it must be that power which is pulling from the other side. And that is why we say there are saints, mystics, who have attained the level of totality, which is what I call is the definition of a perfect living master in a human form. A perfect living master who is walking amongst us in a human form has that awareness beyond that Bhavan Gufa. And therefore, his light is such that it can pierce even through the Bhavar Gufa and take us across. Above the mind, there is no way to go anywhere except with the pull of a, of a master. Perfect living master of the Par Brahm stage who has attained the knowledge of the self, of the Atma, and those who have attained the knowledge beyond that of the Paramatma, beyond the Bhavar Gufa. The power of these mystics and saints who are here is amazing. That sitting here, what are they conscious of? What are they aware of? They're aware of everything I've explained to you. It's not that they have to go somewhere to find it. We have to go somewhere to find something. We can go into meditation, see something and come back. They are continuously aware of this. And that is why they can pull us right from here. And their discovery there is very different. Imagine, somebody asked me, when I go to my true home, will I be able to come back and talk to people here? I said, do you know all the people will be there with you? Why? I am doing meditation. No, you pull the whole creation with you. It's very difficult to understand. That if it is oneness, it's totality, there's nothing outside of it. If you have reached a level of awareness where you're experiencing totality, nothing is outside of it, including everything that we see here. Everything we see anywhere. It's all included. So that's an indescribable state. Completely indescribable. I don't know how I'm even trying to say all this. But attainable and experienceable while we are human beings. I don't know any other form in which you can experience it. You can be sitting in the uh, astral stage. 
angels are flying there. Good karma that they are flying there. Creators are sitting up there, ruling these universes. No chance. Why? The full knowledge where they are, they are going there because of a law that's being provided of cause and effect that runs right through physical, astral, causal life. Law of karma is not local. It's created by the mind, functions in the mind and functions in the causal plane and all planes below. So that is why the same law is applying to every being, no matter what. Every living form, no matter what, has the same soul. Soul is not different. We all have the same soul. No matter what kind of bodies we are wearing, no matter what language we speak, no matter what country we are, no matter what our culture is, soul is the same. Soul is the same in a human being, the same soul is in a dog, in a cat, same soul in a tree, same soul in a worm, same soul everywhere. Same soul in an angel, same soul in Brahma, the creator, same soul in every being which is alive. Soul is not different. Soul is merely an expression of consciousness. And consciousness is life. That's what makes us aware of anything, and that's life. So that is why we are in so many forms, including the highest forms. I, I read the story of Lord Krishna, and we worship him as the avatar of Lord Vishnu. That Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, they are creating, sustaining, and destroying the universe. We have made them into gods. I, I can tell you other English words for them also. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, English, beginning, middle, and end. The same thing. They're just representing that. They are also representing any creation where the three gods exist or the beginning, middle, and end exist. Everything that is here has a beginning, middle, and end, no matter what. It can have a longer stay or a shorter stay. But everything has a beginning, middle, and end. That's why within the domain of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma, the creator. They say, if we think they are beings like us, suppose they are human beings, just sitting up with that power of creating and sustaining. And they say when they become avatar, that means incarnation of that form, they become actually human beings. Ram was actually a human being. Krishna was actually a human being. Or they can be in a different form also. When you go to a temple, Hindu temple, you will find there are nine avatars already come, the tenth is awaited. And who are those? If you look at the names of those avatars, first one, a fish. Second one, a turtle. The third one, a boar. Fourth one, a dwarf. Why? How did they take? How can an avatar of Vishnu, the sustainer, come as a fish? Because the whole planet of Earth was covered with water and nothing was there but fish. How could he come as something else? If he comes to see what's going on and to sustain it, he has to come as a fish. All forms of life that has come, the avatars have come in that form to see what's going on, the sustainer. Here is Krishna, considered to be avatar, considered to be incarnation of Vishnu, the god of sustenance. And Krishna is standing in a human form as a small little guy and tending to the cows of his village. He takes on a role of a cowherd and is being worshipped as Gopal. Gopal, taking care of cows. cows. So there, he is Krishna standing there with his young friend, Udo. And they both used to go together. And one day, Krishna surprises Udo by uttering certain words. And those words have become so important. I went to the place, Mathura Vrindavan. I went to the very area where Krishna was born, where he said to have worked, where he lived, to see if people remember him. And people do remember him. Poor people working in the farms, every evening they would gather together 
and sing the hymns, praises of Krishna. I sat with them, but they were taking something in a little smoke, but I didn't take that. <laughs> maybe, maybe that made them sing better, or maybe they saw more of Krishna than I could see. But they sang the words, and I'll tell you the actual words in their dialect, which I heard. The refrain was, Are Udo karman ki gath nyari se. That's what they were singing. Udo, the nature of karma is very strange. Not easy to understand. Where is this line coming from? This line is coming from a story. What Krishna told Udo in his childhood. He said, Udo, you cannot understand karma because karma is not merely cause and effect. Karma is what creates all forms of life. And we can change forms of life merely because of our karma. Our intentions and actions create the result which leads to further life. It can be any form. And he then points out to an ant crawling there. And he says, do you see this ant crawling here? Once this ant was Brahma, the creator of this universe. He's talking of an ant. Once it was a Brahma, by his good karma, became Brahma, the creator of the universe. This very ant at one time was Indra, which is one of the big heavens and governed by Indra. Today, because of the karma, it become ant. The fact that he had good karma to become Brahma and Indra did not take away the bad karma which led to his becoming an ant. People think we can atone for our karmas. It is a very common belief, especially propagated by priests. And they say, okay, we'll pray for you. Give us so much money. Give us so much rice, so much of our other things for our survival and we'll cut your karma down. People think karma can be cut down. Karma is so strong, such as irretrievable, irreversible thing. Good karma, good result. Bad karma, bad result. You be very good in life and deserve one month in heaven. But you do some bad karma earlier or later, one month in hell, both can take place at the same time. That's what he's explaining. And this is the biggest trap laid down for retaining this universality, this of the consciousness coming and becoming souls and becoming human bodies and human beings and different forms of life, 8.4 million forms of life, is governed by the single law. And this law pervades, not only here, it pervades in the astral plane and also the causal plane in the whole of creation. And that is the whole of creation. Therefore, this particular law is holding us here because karma is not created merely by action. It's created by intention to act. So therefore, we are holding so much karma. Where is it held? In our minds. Karma is created in the mind held in the mind, paid off in the mind. It's nothing to do with the body. People sometimes think, oh, a physical body is getting the karma. No. Karma is created by your intention in the mind, which is a thought. It's a thought process. You intend to do something, you create karma. And when it's fulfilled, you feel pain, emotional, physical, in the mind. So karma is a mental phenomenon taking place at the causal level and is played out throughout in the astral and physical plane. That is why karma can be created where you can have an intention to act. Now imagine, where can you have intention to act? Very little chance given to trees. They can't have intention to act. All these small insects, dogs, cats, horses are going strictly by instinctive programming. The only being and the gods and the angels, they know everything. They can't have any intention if they know what's going on. Only human beings in a human body, ignorant of what is happening ahead, are saying, I intend to do this. Use of free will. This is a very big double-edged sword, free will. Free will is given so we can create karma. 
intention to create creates karma. If you act upon it, it enhances the penalty or the reward for that karma. That's what it is. Karma is a very interesting subject. And karma can go on, can be created in human wakeful life. Not in dreams, not in astral plane, not in causal plane. It's, it's all mental game, but it's only in one form, wakeful human life, that we create karma. Looks like it should be very rare events to have so many different forms of life. No, we have intention to act almost every second. There is no way that a karma created by human being in one lifetime can be filled, fulfilled and the rewards and punishment accomplished in one more life. No way. We create so much more karma. That is why karma is divided into three categories. One, which we create, which they call karman karma. That means we are creating by our actions or intentions. And then that which we are paying off from the past, which is called destiny or pralabdha karma. Pralabdha means we brought it from the past and therefore we are paying it off. And the third karma is what could not be accommodated, but doesn't just go away. It is stored in our mind. And that is the stored karma is called sinchit karma and is the biggest storage of any karma. Supposing we lead a life trying to avoid any intention, living in the will of God. People want to do that, karma-free life. How? Go with the flow. That was the common phrase that used, go with the flow. Whatever happens, don't make any decision. Let others make decisions. Let God make decisions and go whatever comes and don't think, I am going to do this, just live with it. Karma-free life. Some yogis have attempted that. But the sinchit karma pulls enough material down for another life, another life, another life. It's a big trap. It's a very strangely arranged but very effective trap to keep this world going forever. And we are trapped here. And how much good we do based upon the advice of our priests, we can get the rewards and then go back to our punishments and then still go back in the same circle again of being born again and again through the principle of karma. So that is why it is a big trap and to get out of it, not possible with any amount of your struggle because struggle is all part of the mental game, it's part of intention. No matter how much you meditate, no matter how much you try, no chance of getting this out of this big circle, big trap. But if you are being guided by somebody beyond this cycle, which is a sad guru or a sat guru, people who are gone beyond the mind, and they appear in your life, they can help. They, can, they will help you by a means which we may not be fully aware of. Why do they tell us to meditate? I have just explained to you what you can experience in meditation. Is it really necessary? The answer may surprise you, not at all. If meditation is not necessary, then what is necessary? What is necessary to experience the pull of that which is beyond the mind and then be pulled by that beyond the mind which happens through love and devotion. That is why the secret has always been love and devotion. Then why don't we dismiss meditation and say we are going to experience love and devotion. The mind does not believe that at all. The mind has been trained not in one lifetime, several lifetimes. You have to struggle to get what you want. Therefore, you have to struggle to get love, and love disappears. When you struggle, you become a mental guy with mental efforts. It's a very interesting game, how the mind starts by saying, I have to do it. So what do these enlightened masters say? Do it, regularly, at least two and a half hours, if possible, eight hours. I did it at one time. I said, let me try once at least. What is it all about? Eight hours, let me try. And I, I was as blank as ever with some experiences. 
some people say, I saw some light. I saw some red and blue and white light. I said, I'll knock you on the head and you'll see the same light. <laughs> what is the big deal about it? Where is your awareness going? What is this little change of experience going, doing to you? Are you finding more about yourself? Not at all. But there is no way. Our mind is so trained. Our communication is through the mind. Our understanding is through mind. We want to understand everything. All understanding is in the mind. We want to understand the spiritual path. The mind has to accept it. Therefore, we have to play a drama to satisfy our mind. Drama is very good. Work hard. Follow this diet. Follow these rules for the mind. Do meditation regularly. Without it, you will get nothing at all. Mind says, oh yes, appeals to me. I'll do it. I'll try it. I'm trying so hard and nothing is working. No, try harder. The mind has to fail and has to understand its own limits. The mind's limits are it cannot go beyond this time space. It cannot function outside of time space. It creates and functions only in time space and has no place beyond it. Therefore, the soul is not mind. We are constantly identifying ourselves with the mind. Not only that, we identify ourselves with our sense perceptions. That's me. Not only that, we identify with this body. That's me. I have to work in this body. Imagine how strongly vested we are in a created universe, in a created form of ours, which is just for having an experience. This is just being worn like a jacket I'm wearing, I'm wearing a body, just to be here, to have a physical experience. It doesn't make it me. Yet we think that is me. No, I have to do it. When I say I have to do it, I refer to my body. What a big mistake. Body has not to do it. No, my thoughts have to do it. Not at all. Who has to do it? That which is me, really, the soul. How does it do it? It doesn't do any of these things. Love, blissful, appreciation. These are words that are relevant to the soul. Love is the most relevant thing. And that is why these perfect living masters, they give different kind of advice to different people. And sometimes we wonder why they are giving different advice. Because they know where we are. Whether it's the time to say, try hard, or time to say, wait for his grace. His blessings will do everything. They are giving different advice because they know where we are, what we have tried already. So that is why it's, for them it's a big game. For us it's a game, but we are thinking it's real. We are taking it as reality, that which was created just for a visit to a different experience. Why did we come to this state of trouble and get ensnared and caught up in the law of karma if we were so happily living in our true home? A big question people ask. Why were we not happy there and come here? Now, this is a very important question. Why did we come here? What's the purpose of being here? What's the purpose of life? What's the purpose of human life? Answer is simple. We were love, but not the experience of love. We made love into an experience of love. We were one, not many. The many experienced love differently than being just love. Straight away, justification for the many. Why did we have these other experiences? That love does not have that experience in the spiritual way that we have here. Here I love somebody and they run away. I look at my emails, so many emails are coming to me. Oh, I love that girl, she's run away, I love that man, and he's now not taking care of me, he's got another woman. All spiritual questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> the point is that we do not know true love which is not based upon the, what is happening here. It is happening what is happening to our soul. When we come in the presence of a perfect living master, what happens to us? If we are ready for that master, 
And that's just a show here that when we are ready spiritually, at that very time, a perfect living master appears in our life at that time. What do we feel? We feel such a strange pull which is not explainable. It's not the ordinary love that we are experiencing. It's something different. But it is a pull, definitely. And that pull is what brings us close. And we understand it much later, what the pull was. So we understand eventually, it's, he's not pulling our body. He's not pulling our senses. He's not pulling our mind. He's pulling our soul. He's taking our soul back to its true home, to totality. So that particular experience can come not beyond mind, right within here, with mind, body, and senses, when that power that is going to pull us beyond the bhavar gufa, that power is sitting in front of us in a human form. It's a remarkable miracle that the very power that's going to take us from creation into creator is sitting in human form here. Because this was the form designed to do something which was double-edged sword, to use free will either for doing intention and acts to stay here forever or to seek to get out of it. That's the distinction. The same free will, which is just an experience, by the way, because if everything is predetermined, all the events are already laid out, you can't really change anything, you still experience it as free will. So if free will has been given to us, the feeling we can decide, we can choose, and alternatives are placed in front of us. You choose what you like. And we say, okay, we think, deliberate. This or that, good or bad, okay, choose this. Looks like an exercise of free choice. And when we look at our destiny pre-written, that is exactly what we are supposed to do. Not only choose that, but the fact we will also say this or that, this or that, and then choose that. This part of the destiny. Pralab says that already. But we haven't read it, we don't know. It's written in the mind, inside, not outside. So that is why this very experience, just an experience, of free will, the ability to choose, has been given to us so that we can choose to go away from here. We can choose to get out of the mess, to get out of this trap. We can choose to seek getting out of this trap. If you seek, you will find. Period. Seeking is the secret. Not seeking loudly somewhere. Not going anywhere else. Seeking within yourself. You seek within yourself, a master will appear in your life. I have seen it all my life, this happening, with every seeker. So that is why the secret remains, that the very free will and experience we can use to seek. If we seek, we will find. And a master appears, a master who takes, up, takes you to the point where you can go at that time. You feel you, feel you have to go further, a new master can come. A further master can come. A perfect living master comes when you are ready even to leave your mind behind and go up. And these experiences come to the seeker, that they go through this, I am tired of this, I wish I could go to a nice place. Okay, you go to a nice place. I just want to have some relief from this problem, okay. But all pre-written. This is a very interesting thing. A man has a problem. He says, Master, I have a problem. Can you please give me some divine intervention to change my karma a little better? Okay, all right. I'll pray to my master, I'll pray to God, you'll get help. Help comes. See, master changed my pralab. Master changed my destiny. And then you go to the astral plane and see, did he change my destiny? No, astral plane says that at that time we will ask master and he will do this pre-written. <laughs> master did nothing. It was pre-written that he will give. You will ask for divine intervention and he will give it and your destiny will change was part of the original predetermined destiny. So you say, master, I now find out in the astral plane, not here. I now found out you will never change anything. I want you to change completely something. Okay, I'll pray. Astral master. And he changes something. See, he changed it. 
you go to the causal plane, already pre-written. Best they will do that at the astral plane. What does it mean? It means that these interventions are part of a predetermined thing, which is not predetermined here. Predetermined somewhere else. If the next level comes and something happens, changes there, predetermined somewhere else. Where are they ultimately predetermined from? Ultimately, the predetermination of the whole show, the author is totality of consciousness. Therefore, somebody says, do I have free will? And I say, do you experience it? Yes, then you have. No, but I want to know if it's real. Well, right now it's not real because I can read in the higher levels that it's all pre-written. Who pre-wrote it? You. Therefore, you had free will. It's your will that's playing out, not so anybody else. You were the totality which created the whole show. Now you're part of one small part of it. How can you say it's not your free will? So free will can be argued both ways at length. And people have argued. They say, if, if everything is predetermined, why should I do anything? I said, because it's written that you will ask this question and I will say, do it. <laughs> Period. <laughs> so the, it is very difficult to understand, but at different levels of awareness, if you go, you understand the full extent of it, and eventually you find, ultimately, it was your free will that created the actual free will here, but you are not what you think you are. You were something that could do that and did it. And everything around you is because of that original free will, which was only one. So it's very interesting understanding. But if you're understanding the full thing, it becomes very clear that what it is, it becomes reality to start with and become unreal as we go down. And here it looks real, but maybe it's not real. At this level, if it can be written beforehand, scientists are now worried about the nature of time, and I saw recently, a few months back, they've done experiments to find that something can be happening in the future and in the past and the present at the same time. And that's very interesting. I sometimes explain the nature of time, what really it is. And I'll tell you briefly right now, we think time is past, present and future. We have no other notion of time. Something has gone back, past. Something is happening now, present. Something we don't know will come, future. Let's examine them. Let's examine the present. How much time does present have? Five minutes? No. Five minutes is the past. One second? No, it's past. I say, now it's past. Before I said it, future. That means present has zero time. Where are we living right now? In now. Somebody sent me a book saying, live in the now. I said, where else is everybody living? <laughs> I have not found anybody living anywhere except in now. I have never lived anywhere except in now. How are they recommending live in where I'm already living? But we don't think, take it like that. The idea of the book was, live in an immediate past. That means, last five minutes, last three minutes, whatever you like to define. Now, present has no time whatsoever, not even a nanosecond. It's a meeting point between the future and the past. And imagine, but we don't feel we are not living in time. We are not living in time. Right now, we are living in the same state we are in our true spiritual form, but we think we are living in time. Examine carefully that if now has no time and we are living only in now, are we not living in a timeless state? Then what is creating, creating this experience of time? Maybe the past. Maybe what just happened looks like it's happening now. All right, we are treating the past as present. Okay, good enough. Let's say present is what is being called past. Now we realize what was present was actually past. What about future? At least there must be a future from which all the events are coming. Can events come 
if we don't do three things hope fear anticipate all these are actually anticipation but when it's positive we call it hope in negative we call it fear neutral we call it anticipation supposing these three words disappear from all the dictionaries of the world and stop functioning in us will there be a future not at all yeah have you ever studied this these three functions of our conscious self are creating what we call a future you don't have them no future therefore it is something that we are already anticipating and is coming up as a future something we are afraid something that's built into our fear where do we hope does it take time yes one second two second 10 second one minute when we hope it's a function of mind thinks hope is a thought fear is a thought anticipation is a thought every thought takes time therefore if it is a thought hoping fearing anticipating is a thought it is taking time and therefore it's in the past the moment we start hoping it's gone to the past what we call future is actually past understand it very it's a very interesting subject that what we are calling future and present is all past past is past okay how can anybody experience the past there's only one way memory no other way conscious memory generates an experience of the past when we remember it comes like what is happening now in life we think is now happening we are deciding is all pulling out events from the past that means something has already been stored then only we are remembering it and if it never happened how can you remember it it has to happen somewhere so you can remember it now i'll tell you the secret where it happened it happened in the causal plane where the entire life was packed up into a single memory unit which we are carrying in the astral and physical forms and the play out looks like reality the play out projects the experiences that are being un- unfolded it's like a 3d movie 4d movie 11d movie that we are watching pre recorded pre selected who selected it who selected this movie we are playing out if it's our own memory we must have selected it yes we did where in the causal plane so i sometimes describe this that there were a lot of dvds 4d 11d movies different dimensional movies and when the soul decided to have this experience it picked up one of them and we are playing it out in these three regions if it is true one should be able to verify it i suggest to go in and check it out that is the truth that's what we are playing dvds that we picked up who is responsible for our karma we ourselves we picked up this life why did we pick up a life of pain life of suffering life of disappointments and frustrations couldn't we pick up the best we should be very happy kings ruling over kingdoms no we picked up a movie in which we found that after so many lives of show which is a movie we should be able to get out and go home we could see at that point what the future is we saw at a particular time when we are tired of this experience tired of the movie we'll come across a perfect living master who will take us back home doesn't matter the rest is dream like we'll go through it we have got the good ending that's why we picked up the movie we people who think we are seekers have been very clever actually to pick up a movie with that nice ending in it and that is what is being played out when was this whole arrangement made that you could pick up movies like this and be there for some time or longer time everybody will go when the whole creation is destroyed but we can go earlier and the show earlier when we feel we are tired of it seeking of the truth seeking of true home comes when we are tired of this experience if somebody is still enjoying this experience time has not come 
But sometimes we think we are tired, but we are not. We, I, I maybe mentioned to you, a friend who came and said, I am very happy, I've got everything. Next week he came, he was so unhappy, because happiness he was attributing to material things, unhappiness to emotional situations in his life. It's a combination. If you look at human life, you will find we are all equal. Some have more material happiness and less emotional and mental happiness. Some have more mental happiness, less material happiness. Some have more mental suffering, less physical suffering. Some have more physical suffering, less mental suffering. I saw those people singing the songs in the homeland of where Krishna was born. They were so happy. Now, I don't know whether the happiness came from their feeling that they have a spiritual upliftment taking place or whether the little smoke was doing something, I'm not very sure. But they were very poor. They had nothing material. They were much happier than the most richest people I have met here in the West. They were happier than that. The richest did not make people happy. Some of my richest friends are the most unhappy today. And the riches are doing nothing for them. Sometimes they say, let's take off some of your riches if you don't like them. No. Riches look like they'll make you happy. People think, if we were rich like that person, we'd be happy. They don't know his life. Go and stay with these people who look happy to you. Two days, you find out their life. When you see there's such a division between what can be called a tangible visible thing that we think gives happiness, or intangible things that are happening emotionally and mentally in us, and the balance you will see, very well distributed. And most of us are pretty even in that. But we think we are different because we measure from one side or the other. I've shared these things with you just because I experienced them with my master, Hazur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh. I have not come to teach you anything. I have come to share that you have the ability as human beings, as seekers, you have the ability to have all experiences. Not only experiences, the ability at the right time to even escape from what you think is a show that you didn't like. Now you want to end it and go back home. Time has come now. I'll be very happy to see you for a little while in the afternoon. Maybe answer a few questions. I believe there are lots of questions that have been put into a box. And uh, also, is Prashad being distributed? Prashad? In the afternoon? In the afternoon. Okay, we'll uh, have uh, Prashad. You know what Prashad is? Prashad is something blessed. Normally, great master used to give us some kind of puffed rice, pulia we used to call it, and that was given sometimes for kids like me, we would look for the right type when he's giving. So there were some sweets in it, patashas, and if some, there were no patashas visible in his hand, we would skip the line. <laughs> patashas came and his hand forward. Just a way, but the the real beauty of the prashad was that we could take a little bit of that, eat it, and remember the master. Some people think prashad has some other qualifications. Some people think it's a substitute for medicine. I heard people saying, oh, my child was very sick, I gave some prashad. No, no, you should give some proper medicine for fever, not prashad. Of course, it's good. Give prashad also if you want to remember the master. A blessing of a food does not change its molecular structure. It remains the same thing. The only thing added is the memory of who gave it, when it was given, and that comes back when we eat it. And that's why this blessing, what I am going to give you in the afternoon, I'll seek the blessings of my master, Hazur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh. And I know his blessings are very powerful. I've experienced them. And when I get the blessings of Master Andhra Prashad, I'm sharing something I am getting. So that is why 
prashad becomes important take little bit of it so that you can remember this event every time you take it and if the prashad which is a small little packet we are going to give you great master gave a bigger one with his hands like that and we had to open our shirts or the women had to open their scarves to get the prashad there were no bags here if it is a little bag if the bag becomes half way full and you're not going to see master for a long time or not going to meet anybody spiritual in a long time then find the same thing from the market buy some and put it in the bag and shake it thoroughly so you can never know which one is prashad and not then all of it will function like prashad or whatever you take will make you remember the master that's what great master told us and we used that effectively and we had unlimited prashad till we were sure we are going to go to the next meeting with him next of sang with him and then we got more prashad so i am just describing what uh, prashad is for and uh, take it like that and if you don't feel like it you don't have to it is not uh, necessary you should get it if you feel that you want to remember what now here the prashad is be given because i am talking about great master and i am saying i seek his blessings because you can't see him he is dead he died on the 2nd of april 1948 but i see him if you were initiated by him you would also see him at least one person here is initiated by him besides me i was so happy to meet him and he is he is here amongst us and he will enjoy the prashad more than anyone else but you can remember this occasion remember this meeting and that will also be helpful in taking the prashad but your choice in the afternoon we'll do that and i'll answer a few questions and that will end our two days program i'm very happy to see you all again and blessings to all of you thank you